Perfect. Well, thank you very much and welcome to this afternoon's session uh, on information manoeuvre at the Rusi Land Warfare Summit. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Pete Apps. I'm Global Affairs Columnist for Thomson Reuters. Uh, I'm also, as some of you know, you've heard me speak before, a reservist with the British Army uh, with 77 Brigade. Um, very uh, thankful to Rusi, thankful to CGS for having me here this evening, uh, sorry, this afternoon. Um, for those who don't know me, my background, I was a reservist at university. I was a reporter for Reuters in Southern Africa and then during the Sri Lanka war, which was my year of living dangerously. Everyone else has their Afghan war anecdotes. I have my Sri Lanka war anecdotes and I deploy them whenever my slight PS PTSD allows. Um, and since then, I've done various jobs for Reuters. I also run a think tank in my spare time. I do various other things. Um, really interesting panel this afternoon on information maneuver. People keep on asking what information maneuver is. My line is that it's basically where all these new things and quite a lot of old stuff comes together. Information warfare is not new. People have been trying to persuade cities to surrender. People have been trying to persuade people to change sides since the dawn of time. But now we do it on Twitter and other platforms. On which note, the presentations here are, I believe, on the record. The off-the-record discussions are off the record. I will go through Twitter afterwards. I will find out anyone who has broken that. And I will try and encourage Rusi to use whatever sanction they see fit. <laughs> on that note, we're going to introduce the panel. Uh, sorry, you couldn't give me the, show me that list of names. Uh, just bring that list of names. It's on my lap so I can see it. Working from the far right, geographically, but not politically, I suspect, uh, we have uh, General Sir Chris, De uh, Sir Chris Deverell, uh, Commander Joint Forces Command, probably needs very little introduction for this audience. Likewise, Brigadier Tom Copper de Symes, currently Assistant Chief of Staff Operations at Army HQ. Um, on the far left, we have uh, Christopher Squire, Defence Director at Roke. Um, he is a former soldier, Royal Artillery, uh, who now works in the interesting techie communications space. And finally, Alexandra Altinger, Chief Executive Officer at Sandair Investment Office, uh, who will talk about these things from a more financial services perspective. On that note, I'm going to hand over to General Deverell, who I believe is our first speaker, to crack on. Thank you, Peter. So good afternoon, uh, ministers, chiefs, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a great pleasure to be back here. I, I missed this conference last year. I was um, literally a few days into my uh, uh, what was then new appointment, and so I knew nothing, uh, and so I didn't come. But I've been coming for many years, and now after a year um, doing my job, I now know everything, so I, I was um, happy to come. Um, the, the subject uh, of this panel this afternoon um, loosely described as confronting the information challenge. Um, so by way of a scene setter, what I'm going to do is to describe the challenge as I see it, say what we're doing about it, and um, leave hanging a few thoughts really for the discussion about what more we still need to do. So first, what is the information challenge as far as it affects UK defence? Well, I think the first thing to recognise, and this is kind of blindingly obvious, um, is that it's a big deal. I was at a, a CEO's gathering on innovation the other day, and uh, I listened to um, a gentleman called Ashok Vaswani, who is um, the CEO of Barclays Retail and Commercial Banking. And he said about the digital revolution that it was much, much bigger than either the industrial or agricultural revolutions. Much, much bigger. Now, he didn't offer any metrics to evidence that claim, and I think we could have, you know, no doubt years of academic debate about how you would measure that and, and you know, is it accurate. But it feels about right to me, I have to say. So I'm going to, you know, proceed until apprehended on that assumption. The digital revolution forces us to change the way we look at the world and ourselves. The second thing to say is that um, the information challenge presents both threats and opportunities big threats and big opportunities. Our task is to, is to mitigate those threats and seize those opportunities. The threats, I think, are pretty obvious. In the interest of time, I shall list only a dozen or so, uh, and in no particular order. But 
There are many, many more. And I'm sure um, you know, that there are many that you can think of that I won't mention. So the requirement for ubiquitous connectivity weakens the security of our information. And our networks are insufficiently resilient for the modern world. You know, not, not a fact in the sense of uh, a cliff edge, but a, but a place that, where we could certainly do better. But at the same time, the requirement for security acts as a limiting factor on the development or exploitation of digital. Democratic societies accept that privacy should constrain us. But privacy isn't really recognized as a public good by our enemies or potential enemies. Encryption protects our opponents as well as us. Ubiquitous and common software presents multiple attack surfaces in our weapon systems, our corporate IT, and our supply chains. Expensive systems that we procure are vulnerable to cheap attack vectors. Future equipment which we won't have in operational service for years may be negated before it arrives if we're not careful. The all-pervasive nature of information bypasses our traditional command and control concepts. Physical or geographical ways of thinking and the resulting structures and processes are becoming increasingly outmoded. The volume of data challenges our ability to process it into knowledge and understanding. Information technology development cycles turn much faster than our procurement system in the public sector, in particular in defense, can do. And our huge and stovepiped legacy investments prevent rapid change, it's a fact. Fake news can defeat the truth in the hands of those who play by different rules. And we have to work with allies in this information space. And whilst this undoubtedly brings substantial benefit, it is also unavoidably more complex, time consuming, and demanding of resource than acting alone. And to cap it all, last and arguably not least, our senior leadership was educated before digital took off, so doesn't instinctively understand it. So that list, and I, I don't think it's an exhaustive list, as I said, is, is pretty depressing until you think about the opportunities. And these include the potential for massive efficiency gains and improved services through process automation, new ways of working, and new business models. For example, to name but two areas of opportunity, the potential for us to transform the way we train through massive simulations imported from the gaming world, or to transform our medical services through telemedicine. Secondly, the potential for us to understand much, much more about the world, including about sentiment, and therefore to make smarter and faster decisions. The potential for us to communicate to audiences in a much, much more targeted way, and therefore with much greater effectiveness. And of course, at least some of the information challenges that threaten us also threaten our enemies, and therefore present us with opportunities. So all around us in the world of commerce, you can see multiple examples of people seizing the opportunities presented by the digital age in a myriad of ways. Our challenge in defense is to turn these potentials into reality. So what are we doing about it? And what more do we need to do? So in answering my own question, I'm going to focus on what Joint Forces Command is doing, which is not in any way to decry what others are doing in defense, but what we, JFC, are doing is most familiar to me. So I hope you will forgive what may appear to be an advertisement for my command. No doubt others will speak to their part. Now I describe Joint Forces Command as the Information Command. This is not to say that the other commands in defense aren't interested in information. Of course they are. But unlike the other commands, we in Joint Forces Command, we don't own a huge amount of deployable force structure. And that which we do own is highly information-centric. And all of our non-deployable components and our responsibilities are much more about information than they are about kinetic energy. This is our USP. So we aim to be a big driver for defense on this issue, coming at it in a way that is both complementary to and orthogonal to the Navy, the Army, and, and the Air Force. So where has JFC got to on this? 
Well, first and probably foremost, we have a, a strategy, a JFC strategy, the guiding principle of which is through innovation, integration, and information, Joint Forces Command will, de deliver, will deliver advantage to the Joint Force. The strategy contains nine actions which we are now implementing, all of which bear on the information domain. Those actions include, for example, strengthening our leadership, for example, to attend to the point I made earlier about leadership not necessarily having grown up uh, it, during the digital age, optimizing our workforce for its tasks, which is all about making sure we have the right skills and capabilities in the organization to confront this information challenge, building an innovation ecosystem, which is one mechanism by which we will um, more rapidly take advantage of, of digital opportunities, and defining joint force advantage, at the core of which we'll be confronting this information challenge. With DSDL, we have continued the um, work that my predecessor kicked off under the concept warfare in the information age, which I think um, uh, is pretty much common parlance now, but we, which we now want to take further forward into delivery of capability. We're experimenting of, uh, with, with uh, of new ways of working and new command and control constructs using the Stanley Joint Force headquarters. We're establishing new structures and processes to manage information with the imminent recruitment of a new chief information officer and the separation of that post from the post of chief executive of our delivery organization uh, called Information Systems and Services. We're taking the design authority for our information systems back in-house into the MOD. We're introducing ModNet, a new cloud-based uh, platform for office services in the base and deployed spaces, delivered by three major new contracts. We are, uh, or have, sorry, I should say, established an open source capability that will, in due course, I am sure, transform our understand function and we are expanding our cyber workforce, starting with the Joint Force Cyber Group, but there is plenty more to come. I could go on and on. There is a huge amount happening. But I would also agree there is a great deal still to be done. So let me conclude by saying, by pointing in, in those directions. What do we still need to do or do more of? And I'll keep this final list quite strategic uh, in order to be brief, but again, it's not exhaustive. First and definitely foremost, we need to recognize the world we are in, which is not the world we envisaged a decade ago. All around us, as I said, empires are rising and crumbling. We need to be the former, not the latter. Second, we need to adjust our education content and methods, our trade structures, our recruiting processes, etc., to foster the skills we need in our human capital. Third, we need to work with other government departments and our own and allies to furnish policies that level the playing field as far as possible uh, between ourselves and our enemies without sacrificing the things we hold dear. And finally, we need to go after the things that secure our advantage. Big data analytics, AI, autonomy, machine learning. We need to get really serious about data in a, in a more fundamental way than we have done hitherto. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I, uh, I suppose I should begin with an apology to the Director General and the other RUSI members present for starting with a quotation delivered by the CGS at the other place, which is probably as close to heresy as I want to come to at Church House. And for the Chatham House members here, um, you probably owe me a beer. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to explain why the Army is talking about a concept called Information Maneuver, recognizing that may turn out to be a working title. I'll try and explain what that term might mean and explore some of the themes that might underpin it. Now, what I'm not going to do is go on about the ubiquity and pervasiveness of data. I'm not going to remind you that we've generated more data in the past two years than we generated in the whole of history up till then. 
I'm not going to remind you that Moore's Law tells us by 2020, the average desktop PC, if we still have such things, will have more processing power than the average human brain. But I am going to remind you that in spite of all that processing power, only about 0.5% of all the data we generate is actually analyzed and used in a productive manner. And therefore, right up front, in line with uh, what Commander Joint Force Command has just said, I'd question whether we are properly configured to transform data into information and then leverage that information to best effect. So first, what do we mean by information maneuver? The easy answer is we don't know just yet. It's a concept rather than doctrine. And so the Army Board has directed a small team to better define it and to determine how we might exploit the synergies between our information-centric land capabilities, both in their own right and in support of the wider joint force. Now, though we don't have a formal definition of information maneuver, I expect this piece from ADP Ops gives us a start point. And obviously, I'd focus on the point of achieving a position of advantage. So that's my starting hypothesis, that the familiar notion of maneuver as achieving a position of advantage will apply in the information environment as well as it does more broadly. Now, there's undoubtedly more work to be done to define what fire and movement means in this case. And there'll be a whole raft of doctrinal work to be done, hopefully not by me. However, I suspect we will find that work from previous generations, particularly in the electromagnetic spectrum, will provide a bit of a guide to where we go next. But why this particular focus on information maneuver now? Well, as CGS reminded us, the British Army has responded to the changing character conflict with a new capstone doctrine called integrated action. The application of the full range of lethal and non-lethal capabilities to change and maintain understanding and behavior of audiences to achieve a successful outcome. So integrated action provides the doctrinal demand signal for information maneuver. Integrated action calls for careful analysis of various audiences, actors, adversaries, as well as enemies, which informs the design of a series or sequence of targeted actions leading to the desired effects and ultimately the intended outcomes. So a prerequisite for integrated action is a sophisticated and continuous understanding of the operational environment in general and accurate and up-to-date situational awareness in particular. Integrated action calls for information to be used as a weapon in its own right as well as an enabler for other capabilities. And whilst our command philosophy of mission command is deliberately designed to promote delegated freedom of action when communications are degraded or destroyed, integrated action relies on the connective tissue of communications to coordinate and concur land formation activity with that of the wider force, whether that be the other components, allies, interagency partners, all to deliver the requisite outcomes. So, integrated action calls for resilient networks and effective agile information services and applications using the whole range of communication channels available and not just digital ones. So, enough of the concepts and doctrine. I've got six months before I have to tell the Army Board what I think information maneuver is, so I'll try not to do it here. Nevertheless, I would like to tell three stories in Church House, we might call them parables, which between them might hint at how proficient people when suitably informed, appropriately empowered, and free to think the almost unthinkable, might unlock some of the potential game changers that the information age might have for the land and the joint force. They're about manhole covers, shipping networks, and Elvis Presley's favorite hotel. In 2004, a young doctoral student was electrocuted by a stray vault as she walked her dog on the streets of a large western city. An uncovered wire under the road had electrified the manhole cover on which she stepped. Tragically, she died, and the ensuing outcry led to a bill being passed, meaning any utility company whose negligence led to someone's death would be swiftly out of business. Now, the utility company in question had over a quarter of a million manhole covers in the city, and they had no option but to go out and inspect them manually. Inevitably, that was manpower intensive, 
it was slow, and it was very, very expensive. Luckily, an innovative young engineer came to their aid. He designed a small sensor and emitter, which could be fixed to every manhole cover to tell the central control system if a dangerous current was present. Now, that was clever, but it was necessary to keep the public safe and the company in business. But what was really clever was the company then realized its sensors and emitters could do an awful lot more. Not only could they satisfy the regulations and prevent accidental deaths, they could also use those sensors to improve the efficiency of their transmission. It led to quicker restoration after power disruptions. It lowered operation and management costs. It helped to manage demand spikes and so on. Then, of course, they got properly clever. Once you've started to install those sensors and emitters to every manhole cover, you can then start to think what else they might collect and tell the world. Traffic and weather data, environmental and noise pollution, I could go on. Now, I'd love to tell you that they're self-sustaining solar-powered manhole covers made from recycled material. They're not yet, but I think you probably get the message. That isn't a story about manhole covers. It's a story about a culture of innovation, determination, and lateral thought about how data can be exploited to give us knowledge and even wisdom. Story two. For thousands of years, ever since we harnessed the trade winds and learned to navigate beyond the horizon, we developed a very extensive global shipping and transport network. We moved food, gold, fuel, people, ideas, but our wrangling gear and longshoremen had to cope with all shapes and sizes of cargo. A treasure chest here, a cow there, a tractor, a tree trunk, so on. We had a network, but it was very inefficient. In 1955, a trucking entrepreneur called Malcolm P. McLean invented the shipping container, what we now call the ISO container. He realized it'd be much simpler and quicker to have one container that could be lifted from a vehicle directly onto a ship without at first having to unload its contents. Containers could be moved seamlessly between ships, trucks, and trains. This would simplify the whole logistical process, and eventually implementing this idea led to the revolution in cargo transportation and international trade that we've seen over the past 50 years. Now, not only did the ISO container hugely increase the capacity and productivity of the network, it eased consignment, tracking, and delivery, and it hugely improved security. Whilst the metaphor doesn't transfer perfectly to data networks, again, I think you'll get the parallel. And in broad terms, I'm sad to say the army is living in a pre-ISO container data world. I hope somewhere in this room might be the Malcolm P. McLean who will change that to improve the productivity and capacity of our network and transform the security, availability, and exploitation of that data. My third story is on firmer home ground. It's about some soldiers in Afghanistan, and some of you will have heard it before. These soldiers happened to be in the Royal Artillery where corporals are known as bombardiers. They were serving in Helmand province and were delivered some I-Star equipment to help protect their forward operating bases. Now these cameras set on very tall masts and they were extremely good at surveying the local area to prevent the base being surprised or IEDs being dug into tracks and roads. They could see in the dark and they had motion detectors to alert the operators. Undoubtedly, they were a significant improvement to each individual base's protection. But this story isn't about the cameras, it's about the bombardiers. They were, like many of our soldiers, cunning, curious, and crafty. And like most of our soldiers, they were very easily bored. So they very quickly established that the cameras weren't just cameras. They also had a microwave transmitter receiver built into them. And if they were sighted cleverly, they could not just protect their own camp, but form a network to transmit data across the whole of Helmand. Now, many of you in this room will know that the Cortez network completely revolutionized the way we conducted kinetic and non-kinetic targeting in Afghanistan. Few of you will have known that it was created bottom-up by those bombardiers, no doubt with a bit of help from intelligences and signals, by leveraging spare capacity and capability in kit that they had been given for another task by a chain of command that did not fully understand the latent potential in the box that they had bought. Even few of you will have known, including me until I researched this speech, that the Cortez network was not named after a Spanish conquistador, but rather after Elvis Presley's favorite hotel in Las Vegas, the El Cortez. I think I mentioned that our soldiers are easily bored. <laughs> now, I hope you'll agree that the spirit of innovation, curiosity, and mild irreverence that underpins those stories 
is richly present in our soldiers, including and perhaps particularly in our reserve soldiers. So I think when it comes to information maneuver, we're building on firm foundations. But so what else do shipping containers, manhole covers, and the Cortez network tell us about information maneuver other than the need for those cunning, curious, crafty soldiers? Well, three points to round off. One, we're in danger of being swamped by data, but asphyxiated by a lack of knowledge. Surviving and winning will come from targeted collection, better integration and protection of our networks, automated and human processing, and people who know not only the right questions to ask the data, but also how to use the answers to optimal effect. Second, we need to move very fast to catch up with some of our competitors, both state and non-state. But we mustn't lose our soul. We are not Daesh, and we don't live in an autocratic state. Churchill reminded us that in war, the truth is so valuable that it needs a bodyguard of lies. But while we should definitely be prepared to deceive our enemies to deliver competitive advantage, we should be very wary of deceiving ourselves. Last, in an ever more technological world, we must not forget that we're dealing primarily with people and their thought processes, the cognitive domain. As a retired Major General in the audience reminds us constantly, war is about people, not stuff. And the most critical battle space remains the six or so inches between our audience's ears. Thank you very much. So within the context of information maneuver, which Tom has outlined, I've been asked to expand on how the Army achieves a balance between seeing smarter whilst managing information overload in order to make informed and rapid decisions. So every year we have more powerful processes, higher bandwidth data connections, and cheaper and faster data storage. We now have the ability to collect and store huge amounts of data at very low cost. It's easy to be lulled into the idea that we can solve any problem if only we had enough data. However, the contention that I wish to explore today is that data alone is not enough. We need a way of thinking about the information domain. We need appropriate tools, and we need well-trained personnel. I would like to, start about, I'd like to start by talking about the value of the cognitive hierarchy and how to leverage it for advantage. So what is the cognitive hierarchy? Well, data is a raw signal. It's a one or it's a naught. It's an amplitude or it's a phase. Data gives you nothing on its own apart from an expensive, although rapidly becoming cheaper, storage problem. Information is the means of conveying relevance to the signal. Information is derived from data. This happens through some form of processing or structuring. Information, therefore, has more meaning than the raw data. We move from data to information by cleansing, filtering, classifying, categorizing, and aggregating raw data. Knowledge is context. It conveys situational awareness. To obtain knowledge, we are drawing inferences from the information. There is a greater emphasis on interpretation than at the level below. And visualization plays a key role here. Wisdom is actionable. It allows a decision to be made. It's the level for the decision maker and addresses the so what questions. Wisdom is about understanding what knowledge means to the organization and to the mission. So in order to give relevance and context to the data and make it actionable, we need to adopt different technologies, such as trend analysis, sentiment analysis, natural language processing, machine learning, and other data analytics techniques, to name but a few in this rich landscape. Such technologies were used in this example from OpenReach, which was submitted to Rusi as part of a big data review by CDI. The data, some 900 terabytes, already existed, but without the relevance to generate information and the context to derive knowledge, it appeared to have no intrinsic value. BT brought together domain experts, field engineering teams, with technical investigators, data scientists, with a single purpose, DevOps in action, a theme I'll return to later. 
This generated the right relevance and context, which in turn resulted in an improved level of understanding and actionable wisdom, which brought about a tangible result. In this case, a £24 million saving. When we make the data relevant and ask the right questions, we get useful information. When we interpret that information and add context, we gain knowledge. When we use that knowledge in different situations and synthesize the outcomes, we reach wisdom. Therefore, if you're trying to leverage the information domain to generate advantage to the medium of the cognitive hierarchy, I would contend that it's more about leveraging big wisdom than it is about big data, which is just a means to the end. Now, this is highlighted by Alex Bezakovich and Steph Stevens in, in a New York Times article published in 2015. They contended that if you're trying to build a self-driving car or detect whether a picture has a cat in it, big data is amazing. But here's a secret. If you're trying to make important decisions about your health, wealth, or happiness, big data is not enough. The question they ask is, so what can big data do to help us make big decisions? And they go on to say, one of us, Alex, is a data scientist at Facebook. The other, Seth, a former data scientist at Google. There is a special source necessary to make big data work, surveys and the judgment of humans. It's these two concepts, surveys, or I'll refer to them as tools, and the judgment of humans that I want to pick up on next. There have been some excellent examples of where the tool has beaten the human. IBM's Deep Blue Victory over Chess Grandmaster Gary Kasparov in 97, and Google DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo Victory in 2016 are but two examples. But if we go back to the contention that the nature of warfare remains unchanged, then it's essentially a human activity. And therefore, it's about harnessing both the human and the tool, not one or the other. I use the term tool really to refer to the underpinning algorithms, such as Bayes' theorem of probability, that help us access the higher elements of that cognitive hierarchy, as opposed to machines, which were the key to success of the Industrial Revolution. A good example of how advantage can be uh, created through this additive combination of human and tool is the success of the Oakland A's in the 2002-2003 Baseball World Series. This has been captured in the book called Moneyball by Michael Lewis and the film of the same name starring Brad Pitt. So if you're not into Brad Pitt or reading, then Lisa Simpson sums it up all quite nicely in episode 467 of The Simpsons called Money Bart. So in 2002, the Oakland Athletics won 20 consecutive games and became the American League West champions. This was a remarkable achievement for two reasons. They had a lot less money than most of their rivals and they assembled significant elements of their team from players that the richer teams had rejected. Billy Byrne, the general manager, had the courage to back the analysts and buy players you've seen by other teams and by his own accounts and his own scouts to be less than ideal. Remarkably, the data at the heart of the analysis was available to everyone. Paul DePoster, the brains behind Oakland Day's uh, success, puts the point very well. I think about analytics much more broadly than others do. To me, it's not about numbers or algorithms. For me, it's really about a mindset of using information to make better decisions, especially in the face of uncertainty. And Nate Silver, in his book, The Signal and the Noise, describes the technique used by the Oakland Days as a fusion approach that emphasizes both statistics and scouting. He states that organizations that would have been classified as scouting organizations in 2003, like the St. Louis Cardinals, have since adopted a more analytic approach and are now the most innovative in the sport today. Stat head teams like the Oakland Days have expanded rather than contracted their scouting budgets. Perhaps the greatest lesson from the story is not that the Oakland Days use an analytical evidence-based method to gain an advantage, that such innovation was eventually copied and that all the major baseball teams now play Moneyball, the notion of constant competition driving action. Now, this is an interesting feature of the information war race. At times, keeping up seems more relevant than stealing the advantage. Unless you truly identify something unique that no one else is looking for, Moneyball exemplifies this too. No one was looking to do things differently. Another good example of where the human tool prediction and data analytics come together to deliver wisdom-based decision-making is in weather forecasting. And arguably the most important one in history was associated with the D-Day landings. The commonly held view of weather, weather prediction is that a very large computer takes all the historic data, all the data from satellites, weather stations, sensor points, and produces a forecast. 
what, a lot of, well, what a lot of people are unaware of is that after this very large machine runs a very large model with a lot of data, a person comes along and tweaks the output. The meteorologist looks at the output and says, no, tomorrow is going to be hotter than that. This is a massive revelation, certainly if you're a data scientist. The weather happens every day, and every day the combined tool output with the human intervention comes out as the most accurate decision-making system. So what? Weather forecasting is generally recognized in academic circles as the best example of how to use a computer to do the heavy lifting of the vast confluence of data, while the people are free to explore the nuance in the answers and interpret the tool's output. This brings me on to the final point, correctly trained personnel. From an army perspective, I believe the focus should be on training nuance, subtlety, and context, so that decision makers at all levels can operate with confidence at the higher levels of the cognitive hierarchy. Perhaps more should be made of the way the ink core soldiers are being trained in phase two and phase three training. Should the evidence-based methods being used in INT ACT, intelligence analyst critical thinking, become the norm for all staff officers? This method, this method places emphasis on metacognition, processes including self-regulation, monitoring, control of cognition, knowledge management and motivation, and encourages the analysts to ask questions. Training ink core analysts in this way is a very positive start. However, warfare is a collective endeavor. It's part of its unchanged nature. My challenge to you is how does this type of approach become mainstream so that the staff at all levels are best equipped to operate at the higher levels of that cognitive hierarchy? It's no good having lots of well-trained individuals. The army needs the team to perform well as a collective body. This could also be enabled by a revised approach to how army and industry interact. I would contend that army decision makers like the baseball scouts should be focused on the wisdom end of the cognitive hierarchy with industry enabling the lower levels of data, information and knowledge. This could be done through a whole force DevOps approach that provides closer, tighter linkage between an industry development team who are focused on the supporting tools and their military counterparts. Such an approach would unlock the agile techniques currently being employed in industry teams which has underpinned the consumer shift in our personal lives from a focus on UI, user interface, how a product's surfaces look, feel, and function, to UX, user experience, the user's journey to solve a problem. As such, we are assisted in our daily lives by the likes of Alexa, uh, Cortana, Google Assistant, and Siri, virtual personal assistants that learn directly from examples, data, and experience. The UI for Google is incredibly simple. There is very little to it. The UX, it's the UX that makes it stand out. The speed and the integration of information, whether that be travel, weather, news, pictures, that provides value to the user. I'm not suggesting that army decision makers need to know and understand how this all works in detail. They should, however, be knowledgeable enough to demand the type of UI UX functionality that's out there to assist decision makers. The reason why these tools seem normal to us and the Microsoft paperclip was just annoying probably says more about our progression in the last 10 years than that of the tools. We have and are becoming more digitally literate. Perhaps the army should be working with industry and the tools to determine where they should each sit to best effect within the cognitive hierarchy. Then perhaps the goal of seeing smarter with it, without information overload will be realized, enabling the military decision makers to focus on the element that adds the most value, big wisdom. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A few weeks ago, when I was approached to speak at this conference by one of your colleagues, I politely declined and set out to explain to him why he had gotten it all wrong, that frankly, I didn't really see what private wealth could possibly have in common with the army. Well, he convinced me otherwise, and so it's a privilege for me to be here today. I would like to touch briefly upon three areas of challenge for, this, for the wealth management business, but before I do that, allow me to step back and spend a minute characterizing this business. A regulated wealth management firm has four pillars to its business. The risk and compliance pillar, 
which means understanding the standards we are held to and ensuring those standards are met every day. In a nutshell, it's about demonstrating skill, care and diligence as we go about managing our clients' wealth. It's not about having the right intention, it's about doing it properly. And if we do that, we manage our regulatory risk. The operations pillar is what I call the internal plumbing. It's process-led. It's the infrastructure, which allows the other functions within the firm to communicate and interact effectively with each other. It's about trade processing, trading, administration, administration servicing, and reconciliation. A clean operating platform allows our business to function effectively and mitigates the operational risk. Investment represents one of the two ways we add value to our clients. We manage multi-asset class solutions with risk return profiles which are carefully calibrated to our clients' return expectations, their downside risk tolerance, but which also meet our clients' income and liquidity needs, as well as time horizons. Finally, we have the client team, which ensures that our clients' needs are met and that every investment we make in their portfolios is suitable and the right one for them. Let's be clear, a great investment may still be the wrong investment if it's not suitable for our clients. Clients entrust us with their wealth. We typically have full discretion. Our average client gives us about 100 million to manage and trust us to do the right thing. So a word on trust. How do you convince a new client you are trustworthy and how do you build that trust? Allow me to use an example from the car industry. When you're buying a new car, you take lots of things into consideration. The engine, the model, the price, the color. In fact, there are about 3,700 attributes that you consider, and this comes from one of the, the largest research agencies who looked into this. We call them CPCs, Consumer Purchase Criteria, that people take into consideration in the purchase of a new car. But there's only one which really matters. So I'm gonna turn to the audience, you. Which one do you think really matters when you buy a car? You're sitting closest to me, which is why I'm picking on you. <laughs> the color, if it's a red color, you think that, that makes it. <laughs> Anyone else? That wasn't the answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's the noise the passenger, make, the passenger door makes when you slam it shut. The noise the passenger makes when you slam it shut is typically what drives people to make that decision there and then that they like the car. If it makes a clinky noise that makes it rattle too much, they think the car is unsafe. So it's an emotional decision ultimately that will, that will prompt the clients to buy a car. In the same way, in wealth management and private wealth, we believe there is one overriding consumer purchase criteria, CPC, for a prospective client which provides the impetus for them to approach us, um, and that is for the client to feel his needs are properly understood. The client needs to feel this firm understands what my needs are, and, and they can actually deliver what I need. If we are then subsequently able to make repeated good judgment calls, we then build trust. But it must be against a backdrop of reputational excellence. In fact, when you are in the business of trust, your greatest asset is your reputation. And in private wealth, we live and die by a reputation. And in that sense, every wealth management firm has an inherent fragility to it. So one of the greatest challenges our investment team faces, and this is where I'm gonna actually get to the topic of this specific session, although I will say I'm a bit of an odd animal in that I'm also gonna provide the segue into the following session. One of the greatest challenges our investment team face at, faces is that information has become a free commodity on the investment side, and there's now too much of it. Every day we're confronted with vast amounts of information, and yet we're being asked to make a very small number of decisions, but these decisions we need to get right. So how do we deal with that? Well, the first thing we do is we try and strip out that noise. We need to get away from the bottom of that cognitive hierarchy that the speaker before mentioned, towards allowing us to process data that will allow us to get to the insight. We strip out the noise by selecting providers of curated information content. So there's an initial filtering that already takes place. 
The other important piece is accepting human behavior. And again, I'm looking at this from a financial perspective. I'm looking at this from an investment perspective. Even in a world of quasi-perfect information, we do not take rational decisions. As an economist, this is fascinating because I was brought up with the modern portfolio theory as the overriding investment framework, which makes two very big assumptions. One is we're rational, and number two, we live in a world of perfect information. Well, information is now almost perfect because of the internet and because of technology, but we do not make rational decisions. So in phases of euphoria, stocks have a tendency to overshoot on the upside, and in stages or periods of apathy, they can undershoot on the downside. So I've always been intrigued to see how behavioral finance, some of you may have read Daniel Kahneman's winning, Nobel Prize winning uh, book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, but that, that was the start of behavioral finance. It has now become a mainstream part of the financial framework. So we need um, a framework and a lens through which to view the data, which corresponds to our core competence, so we understand what we're actually looking for. We don't let that information drive our framework. That has to do with pattern recognition. And then finally, we connect the dots. The information only becomes an insight once we connect the dots. Understanding the often unintended consequences, we call it the second derivative of the information you get. And then, we need to debate, discuss, debate, and challenge ourselves. Now, there are other ways that we use information, just listening to the two previous speakers. Uh, what's important for us is obviously protecting our client information. That's where cybersecurity comes in. That's where IT is no longer a back office function for a wealth management firm, but it also has a strategic role in the sense that reputational risk is to a very large degree driven by how we manage cybersecurity within our IT efforts. And that's something that since I've come in, I've elevated to a more strategic status and we have our head of IT now reporting into our COO to ensure that we, uh, that, that we have the right systems in place, including private clouds to protect our clients' uh, data. <laughs> But this very last point here, discuss, challenge, and debate, and this is where I'm happy to provide the segue into the next session. Um, it brings me to the importance of diversity in terms of effective decision making. Why? Because that debate needs to be robust. You cannot have robust debate if you're all looking through the same lens. This is one of the biggest challenges of wealth management. Uh, wealth management see, tends to attract the same type of people. And if the only people we attract are white, male, young, straight, privately educated, from privileged backgrounds, we're gonna be making the same types of decisions because we'll be looking at the problems in exactly the same ways. So it is absolutely critical for us, and in fact, I've put at the very top diversity as a competitive advantage, that we get those different perspectives to the table and that we look at things differently. Um, because we don't want everyone around the table to advocate the same solution. We want there to be robust debate to get to a better solution. Uh, and unfortunately, wealth management wins the award for being the second least gender diverse industry, second only to the insurance industry, which I think is less gender diverse than, than wealth management. So th there is a problem because you get into a vicious circle, and the vicious circle is the following. If I can just use gender as an example. In the way that you recruit, you use a language, and that language may unintentionally resonate more with a certain gender or a certain type of candidate profile you are unintentionally hoping to attract. So it already starts with the language you use when you recruit. If you do manage to bring women into finance, and, and, and they do well, they'll at some point get to the point where they may want to have children and take time off. Financial firms are appalling at creating flexibility around the time that women need to take off, particularly after childbirth, and bring, having, bringing them back into a professional working environment. If you are fortunate enough to have brought those women back into your environment, you're then faced with promotion. Very often there's a pay gap as well, an inequality in gender pay. So very often those women then feel it's just not worth the effort. I have too many balls I'm juggling at home. Why, why am I still working like crazy and really not getting paid in the way that others are getting paid? And then finally at the very top, you know, many women just feel that it's still too male dominated and not a level playing field. And that in turn helps fuel 
and amplify this ongoing perception in the marketplace for younger candidates that finance is not a level playing field. So you really do get into a vicious circle and you need to break it. Now, how do you break it? Uh, I think the language you use when you recruit has to resonate with the type of candidates you really are looking for and you are trying to appeal to a more diverse audience. You need to have flexible working arrangements in place and try and be open-minded around the fact that it's results that matter. You have to lead by example, not by policy. It doesn't help if every senior woman in the organization is working 16-hour days, doesn't have a family or doesn't have time for a family, yet you have great policies in place on paper. That doesn't help. You've got to lead by example. You have to reward results and teamwork. Women cannot do well if there isn't a good team around them. It's not just one individual. There has to be a critical mass in terms of a diversity effort being supported and not just the individual to be rewarded. And finally, it needs to be encouraged and celebrated, giving minority staff members a voice from the very top. Thank you very much.